Welcome, this is the Inclusive Naming Project for Jenkins. It's the 24th of May. Thanks for being here. So today's topics, we've got contributing to open source. And, and what we've proposed is specific to the interests of the individuals in the call today. So the idea is, and, and then Peace has asked, how do new contributors benefit from helping the inclusive naming project? So these are the, the two general topics. Then if, if we feel that it would help, we could also do a review of the general ideas in the Contributing to Open work Source Workshop. Now, those for me are just general purpose. And so I think they're less interesting than if we talk to the specifics for you as individuals. And, and I think actually your individual interests can be of more benefit to, to open source projects than if you attempt to contribute some sort of generically. Um, I became, well, I became a maintainer of the Git plugin because I was personally interested in making sure it didn't have bugs. And, and that maintain, maintaining turned into a very helpful thing for me, for my company, and ultimately leave for me professionally. So those kinds of stories are, are very real for most people who are contributing to open source. They had some reason they started and that reason turned out to be beneficial to both them and the open source project. And because it was beneficial to both, uh, they kept doing it. So, so Peace, let's take your question first, if that's okay. How do new contributors benefit from helping the inclusive naming project? So. So now, if, as I think back to some of the people who joined She Code Africa's Contributhon this time, it's, it's a first in, indication was uh, learn more about GitHub. Uh, Git, GitHub, and software development, right? They may not have had initial experience dealing with that and already contributing to inclusive naming helps that. Uh, they learn more about uh, software development and about, well, let's take it this way, about localization and internationalization. Now, I don't know that you realize that you learn things about that, but you were working with strings in English language that will eventually, some of them need to be translated into, into non-native languages. Um, learn more about software build processes and test processes. So you, when you submitted a change, at least a few of the changes caused the continuous integration process that was supporting that to break. Oh, wow, hey, there's something new. You made a change. It was immediately tested and that immediate testing told you, oh, hey, this is a problem because of this change. So. That's continuous integration, continuous delivery, those kind of things. And then, of course, you helped a, an open source project be more inclusive. So those were the kinds of things that, that new contributors gain. It's a good place. This is a, a really good place for things like there's an initiative that happens once a year called Hacktoberfest. What Hacktoberfest tries to do in each year in October, DigitalOcean, um, as a cloud provider, sponsors an event called this event Hacktoberfest that invites people who may have never contributed to open source to make a contribution to open source. And it can be as small or as large as they wish in these changes in inclusive naming are good small changes that really help the project. You did work finding which things need to be need to be changed that I didn't have to do, that a plugin maintainer didn't have to do, that someone else didn't have to do. And so your contribution gave me time to work on other things. So Peace, did that answer your question well enough or is there more you'd like to, like to ask about it? Yes, my questions are answered, thank you. Great, okay, so Catherine, I wanted to rotate to you now and let's, 
let's ask, I'm going to ask each of you. So Catherine, Peace, and Nafisa, I'm going to ask each of you for, tell us something about some of the things that you find interesting in software development. And let's try then to see how we could take that interest and let it grow and develop as part of an open source project. So Catherine, share one or two things or three or four things that you think are, oh, I think this is interesting about software or this. Okay, um, what I find interesting at the moment is the documentation side of it. Um, because, well, when I'm building software, I really just have to refer to documentation. So if I feel if I understand that bit, if I'm able to read the documentation, then it, impro it improves my coding process dramatically. Yeah. Okay, so all right. That's so that's what I like currently. Improving coding experience by having by better documentation. Yes. Good. Okay. There's one. Are, are there other things that you find interesting? Um, well, currently, I'd say um, I, I don't know if it's I don't know whether it's generic, but really, it's the whole build process um, of, uh, of of building features, adding them to existing software. Um, yeah, those mainly those two things. Okay, adding new features to existing software. Good. Yeah. Very good. Okay. All right. Well, so let's, if you're okay with it, I'm going to take and I'm going to sort of try to time limit myself to not spend more than five minutes because then we're going to switch and we're going to ask the same question to Peace, spend five minutes on it, and then ask the same question to Nafisa and spend five minutes there. So I don't want to I don't want to spend a lot of time on each because most of these I could bore you for a very long time and I could talk an awful lot and not help a lot. So let's so let's talk about documentation cycles if you're okay with that and we'll spend I'll try to spend roughly half the time on documentation and half on build process and how you could help in an open source project. Okay, okay. so so in terms of documentation cycle there are, Jenkins has multiple areas that need documentation help. And, and now let's talk about some of those areas that need documentation help, like the primary website, www.jenkins.io. And it has, um, it has user documentation. user tutorials, administrator documentation. It has um, blog posts of techniques, tools, ideas. It has um, API reference documentation. It has, uh, let's see, some other examples. Oh, it's got, yeah, it's got um, developer documentation. It's got developer tutorials. Now, any one of those things, you can find weaknesses just on this primary website where, oh, this, this thing is not adequate, or this thing is not adequate, or some aspect of this thing is not adequate. And each of those would be a significant contribution where you would learn something about, in this case, the implementation language ASCII doc and the implementation structures mm -hmm. that are being used, the, the way the site is constructed, how its content is organized, etc. So that could help you then professionally as you find ways to express those same things in projects you may be working on at your employer. Now that's just for the primary website. Now, if we think about, there are other things beyond the primary website, like, oh, I really need a better layout here. Just a minute. View, we don't need print layout there. Okay. So if we talk about other 
other th other sites like every plugin, each plugin has documentation. And each of those plugins, some plugins are uh, plugin documentation is so outdated that it is stored in a read only location and needs to be migrated to a, a, a location where it can be changed. So some plugin documentation is so outdated, is out, a, a little outdated and needs the latest, latest features described in the documentation. So each of those is, is sort of small examples. Now, now you may say, oh, but I'm not interested in the primary website or, or plugins. I'm more interested in documentation as it relates to infrastructure. Jenkins infrastructure is maintained in public repositories and needs documentation for things like runbooks. A runbook is a set of instructions to guide someone how to perform specific tasks, um, structural discussion, descriptions, how things work together, what relies on, on what, that kind of thing. All those things are part of that documentation. Now on, uh, so Catherine, we're in danger again. I'm just talking and talking. Is there any one of those areas that is of particular interest to you in, in the documentation cycle? Um, yeah, what's, what's of interest to me is, uh, is especially the user documentation, developer and API documentation, because I already know how to do the tutorials and blog posts. Um, yeah, so the documentation of uh, the technical side of it is what I'd be interested in. Good. Okay. Well, so yeah. so then let's let's spend just a minute on a little deeper dive. I'm going to take okay. just one of those, this API reference documentation, and let's look at on the Jenkins website as part of Google Summer of Code. We had a project that was proposed. It wasn't. This one ultimately was not accepted, but this automatic specification generator for the Jenkins REST API was a project proposal that came in. And I think if we look, we can also see it in 2022. Yes, here it is, good. So what this is saying is, hey, the Jenkins REST API really would benefit by having a a generated document that describes its endpoints, what they are, how they respond, et cetera. And there are many, many of them. So it needs to be automated. So this is a project idea that you could review and say, hey, this gives suggestions. If you wanna do something big, here's a something big that will hint to you. And we hope it will be selected for Google Summer of Code 2023, but it's a, so automatic, REST API doc generator. And now just to give you some of the scary factor of it, this was assumed to be based on our initial estimates, at least 175 hours of work. And you may say, I can't do a 175 hour project. Then you might look at one of these new, these friendly issues and say, okay, what if, what if I took just a small issue like how to improve the REST API documentation for one of these plugins that's described here, something like that, and that kind of thing. Does now there's another okay, document? Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Catherine. Uh, oh no, I was just acknowledging that at least I've seen the uh, the workflow to that. I'll I'll have a look at the API documentation later. Great. Now there was another project that actually has been accepted and that's the pipeline steps, steps doc generator. 
here we go, this one. And if we look at its 2022 version, this one actually will be worked on during Google Summer of Code. And again, what is this highlighting? There's, there are interesting things to be done in, in that area. Now we've hit my five minute limit. Are you okay if I shift gears, Catherine? Uh, we may come back to the adding new features, the build process and adding new features to software, if that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. All right. Okay, so okay, then Peace, we're gonna take you as the, next, as the next candidate for this same question. Peace, share with us a few things that you find interesting about software development. Um, hi, Mark. Actually, what I find interesting is similar to what um, Katrin said, um, especially the documenting APIs. I find documenting APIs interesting. I find um, um, creating build process, thinking, organizing, making edits, and um, creating pull requests. Those are the things that I find interesting okay great well so then in, let's when oh, contributing to us. okay so since we've talked about documenting apis maybe we take your suggestion let's take creating build processes and we'll see if i can give you some some ideas of ways you can contribute there and then then if that's that's good. We'll continue with the next. Is that okay if we do creating build processes then? Yes. Okay. All right. So let's let's look at some places where where Jenkins has Jenkins builds at multiple levels. Right? It's got Jenkins core. Jenkins, there are things called modules. Jenkins plugins, Jenkins tools and tools and components. Let's see, tools and let's call it Jenkins. I don't know how you would call it. Maybe let's just call it Jenkins build tools. Uh, and then Jenkins infrastructure. And each of these has places where where you could be involved in a build process that might you might find interesting. So as one example, Jenkins Core delivers weekly releases. Um, and those weekly releases have a, uh, have a release checklist that we run every week to confirm that all the parts of the build are successful and ready. I'm gonna put a link to that release checklist. It happens to sit in, in on my house. So I've got a location here. So if you're interested in, hey, what's it like to release a Jenkins version? This is, Jenkins core weekly release, and we run that weekly release, and then we do this checklist, and it checks things like Docker, um, Deb file, RPM, uh, MSI, um, WAR file, etc. We also have a, a about once a month we have LTS releases. Are, are delivered monthly. And then, then LTS releases have a release, have release checklists. Now the release checklist here is run by the release lead. And one way you might be interested is, hey, what if I became the release lead to shepherd a, a, a Jenkins LTS release? And so let's take a look at one of those LTS checklists. This is, and let me get here, we're gonna bring it up so that you can see it. So here is the LTS checklist that has been started for the next 
Jenkins LTS. It will be released in June of 2022. And this, this person, Alexander Brandis, has agreed to be the release lead under the guidance of our release officer, Tim Jacome. So here's this release checklist. And the release lead um, assures that the checklist is done. There are a number of relatively interesting technical challenges here. This, for instance, create the pull request. Oops, create the pull request. Where is it? Backporting. Here we go. This one. Open the backporting pull request, which means you have to know what should be backported. You've got community agreement on it. So there's a coordination effort that happens, happens here and conversation. This, this is not uncommon actually also in large corporations where deciding to do a release, we need to discuss what should be in the release and what shouldn't. And so practicing by being a release lead for a Jenkins release helps you get ready for employment where you might do these same kinds of things, negotiating what should be in the release and what shouldn't. So, and I, that's just Jenkins core. Now, Jenkins modules are, let's call it, let's combine them into this plugins and modules. We'll combine them into a single thing. These are independently released and you uh, independently released by the maintainer. And if you found that you were interested in experiencing Jenkins plugin release, what you would do is you would adopt a plugin become a maintainer and release the plugin. And I have learned many things by being a maintainer, adopting the plugin and releasing it. Now that I said very three very short phrases there, and there's actually quite a bit hiding in that, the Jenkins adopt a plugin idea is, let's, here we go, is described here. And what it talks about is the process you follow to adopt a plugin to, to grow your skills enough that you could become a plugin maintainer. Um, the contributing to open source workshop was initially focused on how could we prepare people to be main, become maintainers? How could we prepare them to adopt? Okay, I'm running out of my five minutes again. Peace, are you okay with what I've described so far? Or would you like me to go further? Yeah, I would have loved you to go further. Okay, all right. So, and by the way, you should feel free to interrupt. Don't, I tend to talk and talk and talk, and I apologize for that. You are welcome to interrupt at any time if you've got a question. Say, Mark, Mark, and shout if you need to. <laughs> Oh, and I see Look, something. I love when you explain it. I, I love when you explain and you talk a lot. It's, I get to, we get to learn so much. Oh. Well, and, and thank you for being, <laughs> thank you very much for, for being part of this. And I think, I think there is much for us, all of us to learn as we do these kind of things, right? There are so many things that, that we learn about this that we can also then apply professionally. Oh, you know what? This is like what we did in the Jenkins project or, oh, this is like how I did in this other project I was helping. I helped them. And what do you know? It helped me professionally because I developed some skills that were really useful elsewhere. So let me put a link to that contributing workshop in there just in case somebody wants to, to use it. Um, I do have a question. Yes. Um, once, once this program is complete, do we still get to attend the office hours? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. Oh, that's, you know what? I'm going to go back now. You've, you've raised a very good question, Catherine. That is that you, that I, I have to go back for this one. So we were talking about documentation cycle, right? And, and all I talked about is the places you could help, but what I didn't, didn't mention was the fact that there are people who would love to encourage you as you help. And, and that's probably even more important than the places, right? So Jenkins has documentation office hours. 
every week. And those office hours, they happen at two different times. One during a time for Europe and Eastern US, a one during a time for Asia. Oh, sorry, Africa, Europe and Africa, you're in the same time zone. I should not be con continent centric there. That's not fair. One time, one during a time for Asia and uh, Western US. And what you could do if you'd like to be involved is just join those meetings. And let me put a link to their page because, because the Jenkins documentation office hours, they're mentioned on the, oh, here, let's just go this way, Jenkins. And we're going to look in sub projects, no nope, community documentation, the special interest group. And it's got an office hours link here that tells you when they meet and where you can find the recordings and where you can find the documentation that we use to track it. So our next meeting is this Thursday, Europe time, this Friday, Asia time. So excellent point that how do I find someone who will help me, I think is, is a good question. And these office hours are an opportunity to, to be able to drop in, ask questions. Oh, I hit this problem. How do I fix this? Oh, I've got this thing and the people there will happily help. Okay, thank you. Thank you. For thank that you. Okay, so Peace, let's go back to your question. Sorry about the, the sidetrack, but I had forgotten to mention that there are people who are ready to help, not just things to do. Okay. All right, so, so getting involved in build processes, inside Jenkins, there are actually several different layers that, that may be of interest to how things are built. Because inside Jenkins core, there are, inside Jenkins core, there are pieces, there are JavaScript components uh, built with, assembled with one set of techniques. There are Java components and assembled is probably, well, Java components compiled with Maven. And then there are, there are packaging done with MSI, Microsoft, Deb, uh, Debian and Ubuntu, RPM for Red Hat, um, and others like OpenSUSE, um, and of course the the root of them all is the WAR file, which is done with Java. So maybe you want to learn something about how the packaging works, and this is a great place to contribute. Oh, one more Docker for containers. And each of those is a place where help is, is needed and greatly appreciated. So if you said, oh, you know what? I would like to know how packaging works. And then you can go find which of these things are, are of interest to you and how could you help in that area? Now onward to plugins and modules. So if you choose to you may say, ah, you know what? Jenkins core is big and kind of scary. I'm not sure I'm ready to contribute to Jenkins core because it's so big, but I want to find a plugin. They're fairly small. Maybe I could find something where I can learn and not worry about doing harm to others. Well, let's look at Jenkins plugins and let's look at plugins that are up for adoption. See if we've got, um, oh, here, I have to find it a different way. So let's see, Apache. This one, this little plugin says it is up for adoption. And so if I click this uh, label, adopt this plugin, what I see here is 
there are 108 plugins in the Jenkins plugin set, 108 of the 1800 plugins that are up for adoption. You may say, wow, okay, well, I'm interested in, maybe you're a GitLab user. Okay, GitLab plugin is up for adoption. Maybe you're, you say, oh no, these things at the top of this list, there are lots of people who use this. So for instance, this one that I just opened is installed at almost 300,000 Jenkins controllers. You may say, that's too big for me. I'm nervous about that. Okay, let's take something small. You may say, oh, I'm interested in, in reporting disk usage. So I want to adopt disk usage. Or maybe you're interested in the Maven release process because you want, may want to do something about releases and the Maven release plugin may be interesting to you. You could, you could offer to adopt that one. Others like, let's see, what are some, I recently adopted a, in not too long ago. Here's one, port allocator. This one's a fun one because maybe you have a specific problem where you say, I'm working on something I need to, to improve and it needs to allocate a port so I can start a service on a port that's free. And this thing, actually does that for you. It will help you find a free TCP port on your Jenkins controller in case you need to use it. And so you could say, wow, I'm gonna adopt this. Well, guess what? You'll get to learn something about security because this plugin has a problem that needs to be fixed. You'll get to learn something about development because you're gonna to have to build it in order to, in order to fix it. Okay, I should probably stop now and check that I'm not what more, is there more that you would like to know or like to discuss around Jenkins plugins and modules? Uh, for me right now, no. I'll probably ask more questions later. Okay. All right. So then, then there are still other things in terms of the build processes. There are build tools. So these are typically Maven, uh, Maven plugins that... Jenkins uses uh, things like, so when I run Maven HPI colon run uses the HPI plugin and that's maintained by Jenkins. And so it needs, it may need enhancements. Um, Java 11 changes in the build tools are in progress right now. Java 17 support, if you're interested in, oh, I want to learn something about new versions of Java. Those are all, all things that are happening relative to Jenkins build tools. Now, you may say, oh, no, I'm not as interested in those. What about tooling for infrastructure? Well, Jenkins infrastructure has things like update center maintenance. So in order to decide to download a plugin, let's look at my, my Jenkins installation. So when I go here to manage Jenkins, manage plugins, and I see this very attractive little number three, that number three says there are three plugins that are, have newer versions on my Jenkins controller than are on my, uh, than are installed. So this one needs an update, this one needs an update, and this one needs an update. Okay, how did they know that they needed that update? Well, the Jenkins Update Center generates the list of currently released plugins as a JSON file that 300,000 Jenkins controllers download to check for new plugins. So there's a lot of work that happens there. If we can optimize or improve that, it's a big benefit. There are things like um, documentation generators. And here for pipeline steps, for Java extension points.
and and many more like that. That Jenkins infrastructure also has code around configuration of the Jenkins controllers, like ci.jenkins.io and trusted.ci.jenkins.io and weekly.ci.jenkins.io. You can imagine there's a lot of configuration that happens in these large things and we do it all with code. So there's plenty of places to code in each of those locations. So Peace, did that, did that answer your question or would you like me to, would you like to ask some clarifying things or get some further descriptions? Yes, it does. I understand what you've been saying. Great. Okay. Well, we've got about 15 minutes left. And are there other things that you would like to review or would you be okay if I switched into the general ideas in the Contributing to Open Source Workshop document? Yeah, that's okay. We can review it. Okay, good. So, so let's, let's talk briefly about what this thing's concept is because it's what, where did it start and why? So in at DevOps World 2021, uh, I did a workshop called Contributing to Open Source. And as part of that, in this one hour workshop, I was trying to persuade people why they should help open source projects, in this case, Jenkins, by adopting a plugin. And so what this does is it takes them through, okay, what do you need to do to install your, your Java 11 development environment, your Git, Maven, et cetera. How do you configure Maven? Then how do you fork the plugin yourself, build it locally? And then we start the process of improving the plugin. And now it's this process that for me was most interesting for a new contributor because each of these items is a relatively simple thing. I can do one thing and then I could step away from it and go back to doing other things. And it's valuable. So it's th this is sort of the sweet spot for me in trying to find ways to help open source projects. I want something that is interesting to me, small enough that I can accomplish it relatively quickly, but useful to the project that I'm submitting it to. And so these things are specifically in that kind of area where you say, Hey, if a Jenkins plugin doesn't already have a Jenkins file, that means it's not being checked for continuous integration. It's not being regularly compiled. That's not a good thing. Let's add a Jenkins file to it. That helps a bunch. And the actual effort to do it, well, the Jenkins file we add is a one-liner. So it says in that one-liner, we put that in, build plugin. Now, most Jenkins plugins, thankfully now, have this already. So most don't need it. But if you find a plugin that's interesting to you, this is a great first thing to do. And it's very low cost. You just create a file named Jenkins file. It has one line in it, build plugin. Now, if we, if we say, okay, what, what else? That's, that's done. But then there are plenty of other things like, again, this one, update the parent palm the Jenkins build process uses Maven and Maven uses this thing called a project object mod model, POM. So the project object mo model, the POM, uses a specific version of its parent. And very frequently that parent has developed newer versions, newer versions have been released and the plugin is not using those newer versions. And the newer versions have new capabilities new enhancements that would help that plugin if they would just upgrade to the new version. So you take that step, let's update the parent palm. And now this one may cause interesting, interesting challenges, interesting things to be discovered. Oh, I need to do this, or I need to do that. Because updating the parent palm exposed a new set of checks. It brought in a new set of rules about what can and cannot be included in this plugin. And the plugin was not complying with those rules. So you may, as part of updating the parent palm, also need to 
change some source code so that the new parent POM can be used. So again, add a Jenkins file and update the parent POM, both pretty simple things to do. Update the parent POM, it's one line change. So whereas this parent POM previously was 3.50, I changed it to 4.27, or right now, if we fix this, it's now 4.40. And then I had to compile with this. Now, what am I doing? I'm learning about Maven compilation. This will run automated tests. If some of them fail, now I've got to investigate test failures. Then I'm gonna commit it and push the change. Create a pull request, and, and I've now, with two simple changes, been able to improve the plugin and learn something myself. Now, the other changes here, for instance, the base Jenkins version there, when we create a plugin, we also say what minimum Jenkins version is it supported on? And that needs to be updated periodically because the Jenkins project does not support really old Jenkins versions. So there's no reason for me to be building based on those old versions. Similarly, these other changes, each of them is relatively small. Uh, this one will teach you something about the way that Jenkins defines its web pages using a language called Jelly. Uh, this one, spot bugs, will teach you about static analysis, looking for bugs that a program can detect in other programs. So spot bugs is, is a great thing to use. If you're doing Java development professionally, you absolutely should enable spot bugs because it will help you find things that you might have missed, but the program can find for you. So those kinds um, of things, well, oh, go ahead. I'm not, I have a question. Does yes. spot bugs work for other languages and frameworks? like React and JavaScript? Ex excellent question. Spotbug specifically does not, but there are other tools that do perform. So what, what Spotbugs is doing is it's, it's a form of analysis called static analysis. And what static analysis is, is it's a program running to inspect the source code of other programs. And so there are JavaScript static analysis for React. And let's see what, what this search shows us. So here we go. Here's one, Locastic offers something, 11 tools to help you catch errors. So LogRocket gives us, gives us this. And so here are several that ESLint, this one is used in the Jenkins project. Prettier, this one's used in the Jenkins project. Um, Others, I, I think I've seen some JS hint. I've definitely seen PMD. I've seen, yeah, I've seen somebody use LGTM. I've definitely seen use of Sonar Cloud. And we use it depend about all the time. So so yeah, they there are lots of static analysis tools to use the same technique with JavaScript. You wouldn't use spot bugs, but you would use the same technique. Catherine, did that address your question? Yes, it did. Thank you. So back to the notion that if you're interested in software development, you'll learn things by contributing to open source that you then apply in your, in your professional environment where, oh, you know what? Static analysis can help me write better programs because any bug that a, another program finds in my program is a bug I didn't have to find myself. So why not? Now there are, there are other changes here like, well, here's a good one, internationalize messages and help. Now that's, a, that's an entire field where those of us for whom English is a native language, we have the convenience that most software is written in our language. Others who, for whom English is not their native language need us to internationalize and then translate. And, and the techniques to do that are both interesting, common, and 
in a lot of work. So we're, we just started effort in the Jenkins project to do a better job of internationalizing and localizing. And part of that has led us to a, a company called Crowdin has donated a service that they host for Jenkins, the Jenkins project called crowdin.jenkins.io. And this thing helps people contribute translations. So here we see, well, look at this. We've got multiple contributors to every single one of these projects. And if we look at a, a plugin that I maintain, here you see Chris Stern submitted the simplified Chinese and the traditional Chinese translation. Bruno Verachten contributed the French, Alexander Brandes the German, and Ho fatto Italiano io. So I did the Italian. Yes, I'm not really good at Italian, but I'm adequate. So here's another place where before any of this could happen, I had to internationalize the Elastic Access plugin so that these people could then provide translation. And, and it worked great for me and great for them. And what I found is there's a lot of work to internationalization and new contributors could help with this significantly. So these kinds of ideas, now this whole stack of things, improve the plugin with pull requests, all of these things can be done without ever being a plugin maintainer. You could pick one of them and work on it, and that would be it, no requirement. You didn't make any longer term commitment. But now maybe you say, hey, you know what? This plugin has been interesting enough to me I want to maintain it. Well, then there are yet these other things you can do that will you that are yours to do after you have become a maintainer of the plugin. Wow, I have been talking a long time. Thanks to both of you for being so patient. Are there questions that you have or things that that I should or there are there specifics about any one of these topics that you would think would be interesting to you? Well, for me, I'd like to explore um, all these aspects, especially in regards to Jenkins, because I feel like I'll, I'll uncover aspects that I've not encountered before, mm -hmm. which is then that that's the time I'll get clearer questions. But right now, right now, it feels like we've explored at a high level. And yeah, it needs more time to digest everything you Great. We've talked about here. Yeah. So, so you might you might then consider taking on a. You might say, okay, which, if if you're interested in that general explanation, you exploration, you might look for a plugin to adopt and say, okay, I'm going to be begin the process of adopt, uh, preparing myself to adopt a plugin, and maybe you choose something. If you're the nervous type like me, you may choose something that's fairly low on this list where you say, okay, I, I want, maybe I go out all the way out to the very tail end of it and look at which, which of these might be interesting to me. So if I look a little bit, I'm actually interested in software configuration management, SCM. And so this one might be interesting to me, file system SCM but you might be interested in software test reporting. So test link might be interesting to you, or you might be interested in static analysis like Java NCSS. And, and okay, what is Java NCSS? And should I be, should, they, or maybe you're interested in, in virtual, in virtual machines and then you say, oh, maybe I'm interested in VirtualBox. Pick any one of these and start exploring it. See what you could, what you could get in this thing. Okay, um, so I have a question. Right now, um, I'm working on an e-commerce application, uh, which requires, of course, using a couple of plugins um, when integrating some features. So are there plugins that relate to that e-commerce um, realm? Okay, so, and I'm not sure. So you said e-commerce? 
uh, e-commerce, e-commerce. Oh, e-commerce. Okay. Yes. I see. Right. Okay. Good. All right. So, so when we talk about e-commerce in this case, what you're talking about is something like a a transactions between businesses or transactions between yes. a consumer and a business. Yeah, so, because I've seen some, so there's some aspects where you need to integrate like payments, uh, you need to integrate shipping and you need to use plugins for that. So does Jenkins have such plugins that are used for that so, function? Good, good question. I'm not sure of anything that does payment, payment processing. Now there is, it's a pretty common thing in, in e-commerce environments that you have to deploy the software to you have to deploy new versions to your to your e-commerce provider platform so you you need to make a change to your business logic or something like that and if that's the case then one of these deploy capabilities might be a thing maybe you're interested in azure and you say oh i i've got to deploy on microsoft well, Azure Container Service here, Azure App Service of Service, and Azure Function are all three up for adoption. So, so, or maybe it's oh, you know what? I want to, I've I've got to do it to Kubernetes because our our target is Kubernetes. Or oh no, I need to deploy to to an out to another location. Or I want so these might help you there. Now, okay. in terms of actual payment processing, I don't know that there will ever be a payment processing thing for Jenkins because that's quite distant from where Jenkins usually operates. Okay, all right, that, that's okay. a good clarification. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. Now, I've, I guess I've got an open question. I think we, we've reached end of project. If you'd like, I could see us meeting one more time or we call this done and I give you my sincere thanks. What's your preference? Well, I don't know because this Saturday is the last day. Right. right? Uh -huh. So I'm guessing this is the last one. That that would be my assumption is that I think yeah. I think we would call this our last session unless there's something where you say, oh no, let's do at least one more for further conversation. But for me, this feels like we've accomplished what we wanted to do. Yeah. And and I'm sure I'll I'll be meeting in the um, office hours. Great. I will. I, I'll be meeting you there. Absolutely. I at, I attend the office hours. I will definitely be here this there this week. I will be playing with my son and his wife in another part of the country next week. So I won't be available next week, but the office hours will happen okay. because Kevin will run them. Okay, well, I'll not be available this week. Um, okay. I'll probably next, start next week, but I'm sure we'll meet somewhere within the Jenkins universe. <laughs> I, am, I am certain we will. All right, thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Peace. I'll post the recording probably within the next 24 hours. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Bye.